Hello, I'm Lynn Thompson, and welcome to the BCU Wildcat Football Insider. For the next 30 minutes, we'll talk about BCU Wildcat football as the Wildcats hit the road this past Saturday. Orangeburg, South Carolina, the Cats and the Dogs. And it was a dogfight down to the end. The Cats win it 28-26. Terry Sims with us as always. And Coach, uh, we jumped out to a 25-6 lead over the, cat, over, the, uh, over the Dogs. And the Bulldogs were, were certainly not going to roll over and play dead. You knew it. Buddy Pugh, the, the great ball coach there, uh, changed his strategy, and they came clawing back, and we had to hold on uh, in a great football game that the Cats played, but you knew going into Dawson Stadium that it was going to be like that. It ended up being like that, but we held on with a, a great defensive performance in the end. We, we did, and, you know, away from South Carolina State, uh, we, we knew uh, having a 25-6 to six lead that, uh, going into the, the half, it, it wouldn't last, and, and it did just that. We were uh, attempting to run the clock out. Uh, didn't happen. We ended up throwing an interception, and they came back and uh, threw a long ball and scored right before the half. Uh, and and I, I think our first quarter what was probably our best quarter of football uh, in this game. I, I, I won't say that our guys let up. You know, South Carolina State just made plays, yeah. and, and that's what we knew they would do. We were prepared for that. Uh, and just proud of our football team for continuing to fight through that game. There was a point in the first quarter when you jumped out to a lead where you, you were dictating every aspect of the football game when Buddy Pugh called a timeout, put his offense back on the field, and changed completely their strategy where they stopped going pass first and they, they picked up and, and be, began, became an option football team. They did, and they have the quarterback in the backs for that. You know, their quarterbacks are running uh, quarterback. Uh, doesn't throw the ball bad, but, but you know, his legs are, are his, his biggest asset, and he used them most mm -hmm. He sure did. Let's take a look at the highlights now. The Cats win it in the end by stopping a two-point conversion with two and a half minutes to go in the ball game. Here are the highlights. down the middle, caught by Mitchell at the 41, tries to stiff on a cornerback, breaks out of the 50-yard line, slung down to the 44, Kevon Mitchell. Five for about five yards, on a yard to go. Williams fakes to Robinson, keeps the right side, breaks the tackle in the back, to the 20, the 15, the 10, turns on the Jets, Akevius William has his second rushing score, touchdown, Maroon and goal. That's his tailback offset to the left, a low snap, gives to Jenkins through the right side, and the Wildcats stop him. Throws receiver to the right, the snap to Nick. Under pressure, steps up and he's sacked at the 30-yard line and loses the football. The Cats appear to recover at the 30. Kevin Tufts 
Washington the tailback for Williams. A high snap, gets it down, gets to Washington the left side, 30. 35 at the 40. Dances out near side of the 45 and takes a defender inside Bulldog territory. The four is 46. Right. A shotgun snap, five-man rush. Williams steps up, throws a dart down the middle, caught in the 50-yard run on drag route and down at the 45, John Thomas, the sophomore. Come today. Let's see what we can do. First and 15. Williams play fake. Throws left side. Caught by Jackson at the 50. Jukes pass the defender at the 45 and down at the 41. Washington the tailback here for Williams. Play fake. Keep left side. Squeezes the 40 at the 35 and leans forward with a first down. The two tight and set to the left. Get to the right side. Washington breaks tackle. The 10 takes on a defender inside the 5 and falls four minutes to go. Snap. Hold. The kick. It's on its way. Uriel Hernandez is the snap the shadows to Nick. Off to the far side, face and keeps. And he leans down to the 40-yard line. It's Francois to the right. High snap. Keeper. Williams, left side. A first down and more across the 40. Inside the 50. It slides down. Inbounds the 46. Each team starts their journey on separate roads, but they all converge to one. One road to the championship. There will be revenge and redemption. There'll be an Aggie and Eagle standoff. There'll be Bulldogs and Bears colliding with Tigers and Spartans. Hornets fighting off Bison and Wildcats rattling the Rattlers. The road has twists and turns, and when it ends, one thing is certain. Only one team will claim the title. MIAC champion. This December 15th, the best in HBCU football will meet in Atlanta at the Celebration Bowl. MEAC champion versus SWAC champion. Only one will rise above the rest at Mercedes-Benz Stadium and claim the coveted Celebration Bowl trophy. For more information, visit thecelebrationbowl.com. Join us on Friday, October 19th for the BCU Hall of Fame show and celebration at the Mary McLeod Bethune Performing Arts Center. The reception starts at 6 p.m. and the show gets underway at 7 o'clock as we conduct 13 new Wildcats into the bethune Cookman University Athletics Hall of Fame. Tickets are available now for $50. Call 386-481-2465. Hail Wildcats! Welcome back to the BCU Wildcat Football Insider. The Wildcats went on the road at Orangeburg, South Carolina against the South Carolina State Bulldogs. 28-26. Uh, stay one game behind the uh, first place Florida A&M Rattlers who went on the road at North Carolina a and with less than six seconds to go in the football game. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. But coach, uh, this was a football game offensively where you started out real strong. Akevius Williams continues to play uh, lights out football. Uh, he led the, 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 the team down the field with the opening kickoff. Uh, we get three points right away. Uh, then the defense scores and uh, we're up 10 nothing, and we uh, aren't stopped yet. Uh, we continue to move the football and then South Carolina State uh, changes and they go into their ball control mode to keep us off the field. And one of the things that we did notice, Coach, was that uh, the trend changed. Normally, we have been the ball control football team, mm -hmm. but on this Saturday, uh, South Carolina State held the ball for almost 33 minutes. We've got it 27 minutes. Uh, they had 20 first downs, we had 17. Uh, the stats offensively were virtually the same, but we had the quick strike offense. We did, and, and that's just, you know, Coach Suber and his staff putting the plan together to, to allow the athletes that we have on the field to, to get the ball in their hands and to allow them to, to work with the ball in their hands. Mm -hmm. You threw the ball well. Uh, uh, Kivas continues to spread the ball around. Uh, you employed three or four different running backs. 
Uh, Jimmy Robinson comes into the game when you needed that elusiveness in the backfield. And, uh, and, and let's talk about that. You, you, you employed a variety of different skill set guys. Well, because we have a, a lot of different um, uh, packages for mm-hmm. our offense, and Jimmy fits right in where Quayshawn Bird was. Okay. He, he's that guy that will come in and he'll give us that quick, quick burst, and, and he, he's the back that will run some of our misdirection things. And, you know, we have Tupac, we have Isaac, you know, and now Ladarian Wilson is, is coming on. So those are our three guys that, that can do a lot of different things, you know, out of the backfield. But Jimmy just adds that, that flavor that we were missing when, when Bird was taken out of the, the package. One of the things that South Carolina State could not account for, and that was Akevius' ability to run the football. And, and that's something that we had to get him back doing, you know. And I think, you know, the, the, the offensive staff, myself, uh, we had been on him so much about staying in the pocket, you know, trusting, trusting what you see down the field. He, he became a better pocket passer. He, he delivered the ball better, but he kind of negated that part of his game, mm-hmm. and, and we found it on, on Saturday. 13 uh, attempts, uh, 13 completions out of 23 attempts, two interceptions, Coach, uh, on the day, and, uh, but, but, he, but he still played extremely well. Ran the ball 10, uh, 10 attempts, Coach, uh, 100 yards plus. Two touchdowns, two big time touchdowns. They, they were, and and it, it was uh, you know a couple of the, the times when, when you see a Kivas break the pocket, you know they may have been plays that were broken down, but uh, he's athletic enough to get us out of them. Mm-hmm. And, and you know one of the touchdowns was actually that it was a broken play, but you know he was heady enough to to understand what the defense was doing and, and know where he fit in it, and he ended up uh, getting us a touchdown out of it. I, I think you know when, when you look at a Kivas him growing up now and for the two interceptions he took ownership for it you know he came in in the locker room and he told the team just that that's on me you know I, I I have to grow from this coach no sacks the offensive line didn't give up any sacks uh Kivia stood in the pocket when he felt the pressure he drifted uh, a couple of times he made great decisions throwing the ball away when he felt the pressure uh allowing uh, us to, to regroup and get back and run another play but no play bigger than on third and five when South Carolina State was hoping to get the ball back to try to win it with less than a minute to go when he decides to keep it on his own read. And, and I thank God he decided to keep it uh, because we didn't want to give him the ball back right. with that much time on the clock. But again, that's just a, a, a young man being in tune to the offense, being in tune to the game and the situation that we were in at that time. And we certainly, uh, we've seen this kid grow up and grow up. Now he's one of the better quarterbacks in the league, isn't he? He is. And we knew he always could be. It was just when was it going to happen? And I think every week he has continued to get better. Coach Kevon Mitchell, uh, Stephon Francois, those guys continue to catch the ball extremely well. Malik, uh, Jonathan Thomas, all those guys, you got enough talent out there and you're keeping them happy by sharing the rock with them. And that's exactly right. And I think, you know, looking at the guys that we have, none of them are selfish. They, they all want to win. They, they don't really get into, you know, who gets the, 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 the most catches or, or the most yards. They're just about winning football games. And I don't think we could be blessed with a better group of guys. A great group of guys who played well on Saturday. We'll come back in just a few moments. And we'll take a look at the defense and how well they played, particularly in the second half when the game was on the line. December 15th, the best in HBCU football will meet in Atlanta at the Celebration Bowl. MEAC champion versus SWAC champion. Only one will rise above the rest at Mercedes-Benz Stadium and claim the coveted Celebration Bowl trophy. For more information, visit thecelebrationbowl.com. 
Join us on Friday, October 19th for the BCU Hall of Fame show and celebration at the Mary McLeod Bethune Performing Arts Center. The reception starts at 6 p.m. and the show gets underway at 7 o'clock as we conduct 13 new Wildcats into the Bethune-Cookman University Athletics Hall of Fame. Tickets are available now for $50. Call 386-481-2465. Hail Wildcats! Welcome back to the BC Wildcat Football Insider. I'm Lynn Thompson along with Terry Sims. The Wildcats win it in Orangeburg, South Carolina against the South Carolina State Bulldogs. We go to what, Coach, 2-1 and one in MEAC Conference play now. Yep, and, and I think that's, that's big for us. Yeah. You know, we, we want it to be 3-0 and right now, but there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, our team is continuing to fight, and uh, I'm looking forward to this weekend. So we control our own destiny. We just got to keep winning, right? Right, and, and that's, what, that's what, you know, we talk to the guys about. We're not looking down the road. We're not looking to any other game right now. We're looking to A&T, and, and um, I think that the group that we're about to talk about will, will keep us focused, and that's our defense. Okay, and the defensive unit played extremely well. Uh, Buddy Pugh, we got to give him his credit. This coach changed the strategy in the middle of the game, and that, that was the only way that he could really stay stay up with us and stay in pace with the offense. And uh, to his credit, that's what they did. They went to a ball control, changed up, ran the option, started gobbling up yards, gobbling up clock, and they were able to score. And coach, but you knew then that we had to hold on. And, and defensively, let's talk about the, the linebackers came up big time. Devin James, Marquise Hendricks, those two guys. Between the two of them, coach, 15 total tackles. And, and that's who those guys are. Yeah. You know, that's what we look for, you know, from those guys every weekend because they are both ball hawk guys. They, they have a nose for the ball. Uh, and and uh, the game is important to them. So you can look for those guys to, to give you their best every time they touch the field. Coach, your, your defensive ends came up extremely well, and we're talking about three of them now. We're talking about Todney Evans, eight tackles, uh, Kevin Thompson, KT comes up with four big tackles and one and a half tackles for loss, and then, of course, Marcus Ford. Marcus comes up with four tackles and a half of a tackle. Uh, he and KT combined for a tackle behind the line of scrimmage. Those guys played well, but up the gut. Uriah Gilbert, the big sophomore from Ocala, Florida, coach, he just stuffed a lot of those plays up the middle. He did. And, and you know, we, we've been on Uriah a little bit the last couple of weeks, challenging him, and he stepped up to the challenge. You coach, know, he, one time he tapped out, and y'all just said, no, stay there. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, sometimes you, you, you got to make him grind it out. And, you know, he's the type of guy, he's not going to give you any lip. If, if you tell him to go, he's going to dig deep and, 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 and find a way well, to Let me get tell you how funny it was. It was probably – easier for him to stay in and make the next play than to run way to the sideline. And I think he figured that out after he saw where the ball was. He yeah. figured he could, he could stay on the field and make a play instead of running off the field. Coach, special teams wise, uh, Kennedy and Duque comes up with a huge play off a blocked extra point. And Buddy Pugh talked about that. He said that for the second year in a row, our special teams unit came up big. We blocked the extra point, Kennedy picks it up, takes it to the house, two points. It is, and that, that's the two points we won the game by. Yeah. Uh, when when you, you look at that, you look at how, how much time we put into special teams and, and, and with, you know, Coach Larkins and Coach Lane and, and that field goal block unit, uh, they put a lot of work into it. Yeah. And, and I got to give it to our guys. They, they actually took it, you know, to heart. They took the challenge, and, and they stepped up to the plate and understood that, you know, every play is important, and they went all out on that one, and it, it, it proved to be big for us at the end of the game. Two big field goals by Uriel, coach, and one of the rare things happened. He missed an extra point. Yeah, and, and you know, he's the type of guy, he, he, he beat himself up with that, you know, because he wants to be perfect, and, and that's a blemish on his record. But he, he picked his head up to see where it was going, and anyone you know, just like yeah. anyone that has anything to do with any kicking, if you understand it, if you pick your head up where your head goes, that's where your leg is yeah. going, and that's where the ball is going to go. Yeah, so. Giovanni, uh, Played another good game, solid game for him, kicking the ball. He did, and, and that's the thing that, that we're most proud of Giovanni about is just just being con consistent, oh. staying constant with his technique and, and not, you know, trying to do everything by himself and allowing the guys on the teams to help him. Okay, now let's talk about this kid. For the second week in a row, Trevor Merritt has a pick six. 
Yeah, you know, Trevor Merritt is a guy, you know, when he stepped on campus, everybody said, you know, this little guy, you know, where is he going to play? Uh, and he's played since his freshman year. Uh, we've had a lot of guys in this conference, you know, play the, at his size. And, you know, Trevor's the brains in our secondary. Uh, and and without, without him, I don't know how we would be lined up sometimes. He gets the guys lined up. He puts them in position to make plays, but he also puts himself in position to make plays. And, you know, it's shown up the last two weeks with, with two pick sixes. Coach, I didn't know you had that kind of skill, though. He can move, too. He can. He can. He, he, he's a very good athlete. He played tailback also in high school. Well, he was something, something else. And, and one of the other things, you had a couple of other opportunities to really come up with a, one or two other interceptions. You just couldn't hold on to the ball. Yeah, we had a couple of our guys in the secondary just a little bit uh, too excited and uh, they were running before they secured the football, but uh, we'll take care of that this week. Well, we certainly took care of the Bulldogs in Orangeburg. We'll come back in just a few moments and we'll go around the MEAC and then shift our attention to this weekend. And it's Hall of Fame weekend in Daytona Beach, and we'll celebrate some great Wildcats and a great football team. The 1988 MEAC football champs will come back to campus. Well, that closes the books on the South Carolina State football game. The Cats win it 28 to 6. I'm Lynn Thompson along with Terry Sims here on the BCU Wildcat Football Insider. Coach around the MEAC, Morgan State 18, Savannah State 11. Howard gets things going again with a 55 13 win over Delaware State. And FAMU goes into North Carolina AT and did what folks said could not be done, but you said it could. And they win it. 22-21, now the Rattlers sole possession of first place in the MEAC, and we win, uh, and now we're a game out of first place, and there are three teams now uh, with one loss. There is, it's three teams with one loss, and I think there are a couple teams with two losses that are not bad football teams, yeah. and they can still, you know, sneak into this hunt. I think this thing is still up for grabs, you know, it's still a lot of parity in this league, I'll continue to say that and you can't really predict who will win uh, on, on, on any Saturday. No, well, let's talk about this Saturday, Coach. Coming now to town, the North Carolina a and Aggies. Uh, Coach, uh, the title chase in the race has always gone for the last couple of years through Greensboro, and they're coming in, licking their wounds, and they've got to get things right, and they're coming to Daytona Beach, to the beach, to try to get healed, and they're going to look to do things to us. Well, they are, but, you know, we're, we're looking to win another football game yeah. ourselves, and that's how we're prepared. Uh, you know, I, I think when, when you look back at, at our game last year, 
you know, the last two minutes of the game uh, really sealed our fate. And, and we didn't stop the run like, like we, we should have uh, at the end of that football game. So we just have to get some things cleaned up. Uh, I think our guys understand what we did last year. Penalties hurt us uh, last year. We, we just can't play that type of football game. I think if we stay uh, as mistake free as possible and, and, and cut our penalties back, I think we'll be fine. Lamar Raynard, coach of uh, the quarterback, he's been there 35 years, quarterback in that <laughs> football team. Uh, he, he's a great quarterback, coach. Uh, he's been up and down the last couple of games uh, dealing with some health issues, but uh, the key to stopping them is stopping him. It is, and, and you know, that offense goes as he goes. Yeah. And, and I think anybody that understands a t the last couple of years, they'll watch him, and, and He's, he's had a couple of good running backs, and he still has, a, you know, two of them in the backfield with him now that does a great job keeping the pressure off of him. And he has a supporting cast of receivers that go get the football. Wow. And it's going to be a huge matchup, and we're inviting a lot of people to come out. But, Coach, now, before we go, let's talk about this. A massive celebration in town uh, beginning Friday. Uh, we've got our 2018 class, MIAC. Uh, folks coming in from all over the MEAC to celebrate with us. The Bethune-Cookman University Athletic Hall of Fame, 13 great Wildcats, and we've got one of our own football coaches going in, Terry Williams. This guy has been elected coach. He actually qualified for two categories, but he'll be the first assistant coach going in. Uh, and he could have been voted in as a student athlete and an assistant coach, uh, but he certainly earns his stripes and goes in into the, the Hall of Fame. He, he does, and, and I think it's, it's well-deserved and, and a long time coming. If anyone knows Terry Williams, they understand he bleeds maroon and gold, yeah. and he's a true wildcat. It's going to be a massive celebration this weekend. We've got the Hall of Fame. We've got also the 1988 MEAC football champs coming to town, led by NFL, BCU, and MEAC Hall of Famer Larry Little. He's coming, Coach. A lot of folks. <laughs> That's a lot of folks, Those a lot of guys, important folks. That's right. They're going to lead you out through the locker room to the field as honorary game captains. So we've got tons of Wildcats coming to town, and it's a blackout. And you know what? you got to get your shirts because those kids are selling these shirts all on campus. So we want you all to show up in your black and maroon and gold. So get these official blackout shirts at the bookstore or get them at the BCU box office. We want you to turn out in rare form for this huge event. Well, we're about out of time. If you can't make it, log on to Cat Eye Network, any one of our platforms, to follow the cats. For Terry Sims and the cats, I'm Lynn Thompson. We'll see you Saturday at the stadium.